Welcome to the plenary session on doubt and determination in ethnography. We have asked Rohan to change the background slide so that we could move outdoors and have a fresher look at our problems. Um, I will start by saying some brief words of introduction to the topic. We will then hear the two papers followed by a comment by our invited discussant. And after that, I will be giving the word to the forum. And we will have plenty of time, we hope, to engage with your comments and questions. 30 years after the first EASA conference, when anthropologists of Europe, for the first time since the Second World War, could again circulate freely across the continent, we found ourselves grounded, at home, so to speak. The pandemic has forced us to change the mode of our conference, and at the same time, it encourages us to reconsider the conditions of, the pos of possibility of the ethnographic gesture. Ever since the early 1900s, when figures like Rivers and Seligman paved the way for the Malinovskian revolution, doing field work in far off places became a routine enterprise. Given the means available to the average young academic in the wealthier countries of the global north, anyone could just get up and go and do their field work in the remotest of places. Coming back safely, give or take the odd malarial attack to report their undertakings. Yet these days, this has suddenly become impossible. Are we confronted with a radical change in the conditions of possibility of the ethnographic gesture, or is it just a passing blip? It is too early to know, but I want to suggest that the present hiatus should encourage us to look afresh at what ethnography means. Besides, events developing in countries like Russia, China, Turkey, and India suggest that perhaps the ethnographic freedom of movement, good as it was, was an aspect of an imperial moment that might be passing. In 1964, facing the post-colonial -con conjuncture of the time, Ernesto de Martino warned us against succumbing to an insidious Western apocalypse, in his words, characterized by a reduced familiarity of the world, the shipwreck of intersubjectivity, the dangerous loss of the hope of basing a common future on liberty and human dignity, and not least, the risk of alienation that is inevitably carried by the fetishization of technique." End of quote. Against this, he proposed that anthropologists should adopt what he called an ecumenical ethnocentrism. That is, a unifying ethos that in a deliberate manner continuously drives the sciences of the human towards the humanity that we are here and now in this our historical conjunction. By conjuncture, he meant the dynamic condition of presence, where certain factors combine spatiotemporally to create particular effects, for example, specific configurations of power. De Martino, therefore, calls us to reconsider the them out there versus us in here assumption that founded modernist ethnography and the way it depended on a view of us as complex and them as simple, and therefore on the notion that they were there before us, but that we were the ones who could tell what was actually the case, since their simplicity clouded their vision. This is, after all, in its most basic formulation, the basic, the framework behind Morse's theory of the person and the self that so deeply marked anthropology to this day. Instead, now that most people anywhere can read our ethnographies, our central question has shifted. We are nearly reminded that identity cannot be the opposite of alterity, since alterity is the abiding condition from within which personal presence itself emerges. In turn, asymmetry is not the collapse of symmetry, 
as the latter is always incomplete. An intersubjectivity is not the meeting of self-identified subjects, but to the contrary, the condition for subjectivity to emerge at all. Our fundamental situation as living persons is entanglement. So the problem today is no longer that they make no sense, as it was for Levi Bruhl or Evans Pritchard. Ethnography's central problem now instead is how can each one of us make sense at all when faced with our internal plurality? The presence of each one of us is both singular and plural at all moments of the process of personal emergence. Ethnography's task, therefore, is to find paths of meaning within entanglement. Following Ne Martino's call for adopting a unifying ethos, I suggest that we can no longer afford to root the ethnographic gesture in a critical encounter with a supposedly radical alterity, as atomistically passed into so-called cultures. Rather, the truly radical encounter with alterity lies within the ethnographer's own conjunction. Ethnographers are foundationally amidst, as Heidegger would put it, their world starts where they are, but does not end there. For the history of ethnographer, ethnography, the canon of our discipline, scaffolds the ethnographer's vision. The history of anthropology helps the ethnographer to exercise crit critically an ethos of ever broader ecumenical embracement. This means that ethnographers have to redraw the very framework of their analytical dispositions, for there is no longer any external measuring rod. Ethnography is an encounter between persons, including the ethnographer. However, we now know that the bringing together of many persons is just like the bringing together of one, as Marilyn Strathairn warned us, and as we all can't forget. There is no ultimate material reduction in ethnography because there is no stepping out of history, no external measuring rod. We return to De Martino's warning. Ethnography starts from the ethnographer's conjunction and always moves by relation to it. Ethnographic evidence is based on personal experiences and on relations that are indeterminate because they involve emergence and that therefore are ultimately underdetermined. Yet we are social scientists. As Levi Bruhl discovered, our subjects, and ourselves as subjects, are not bound by the laws of logic. But our ethnographic analyses, as scientific statements, are unavoidably bound by the critical apparatus of scientific writing. That is, the imp one important way in which ethnography deviates from other kinds of writing. Otherwise, it would be a kind of fiction and not a very successful one at that. We are an integral part of the great game of science and technology that has now irremediably changed our planet. These challenges us, for unlike our everyday endeavors, ethnographic narratives call for the establishment of determination. This is the aporia I propose to our two panelists and our panel discussion. I ask them to consider how doubt and vagueness coexist with determination in our ethnographic accounts. Their responses were marvelously creative. They, they are indeed fascinating, as you will soon see. My hope is that they can lead us to a discussion that is not limited by epistemological considerations, but that opens up to a debate on this weird critical conjunction which at the moment is ours. I will now pass the word to the speakers who will present their papers. Stefan Palmier of the University of Chicago and Anne-Christine Tyler of the CNRS in Paris. The debate that follows will be introduced by our invited debater, Ashley Labner of Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada. After that, you can place your comments. In this plenary, we will not respond to written questions as it would 
300 people, it would be too difficult to keep up with that. When you want to make a question, you must raise your hands with a raised hands feature at the bottom of your screen, and then you will be called onto stage. Please do not raise your hands before Ashley Lebner stops speaking, so as to prevent confusion. After that, I will be taking them in groups of, I will be taking uh, uh, speakers in groups of three, and then allow our speakers, three interveners, to respond after each three questions. Well, thank you very much. And I want to end by thanking our speakers for having accepted um, this challenge. Um, and so you will now uh, be hearing uh, Stefan Palmier giving his paper. Uh, thank you, Joao, for putting this fabulous panel together. Um, the title of my presentation is Unhinged on Ethnographic Games of Doubt and Certainty. As practitioners of what is sometimes called an empirical field science, can we describe matters we have no concepts for? One place to start is Evan Spritchett's ethnographic defense of the rationality of Sunday conceptions of the role of witchcraft in their lives. EP presented a nuanced picture of a perfectly rational conceptual scheme, just one based on false premises, that is, mystical instead of scientific ones. E.P. used his own ethnographic persona to good effect, as when he admitted that running his own household in Sunderland in accordance with the Poison Oracle delivered fine results. But those admissions were as far as he would go. Yes, Sunday got it wrong, while a reasonable Englishman gets it right because his outlook is in accordance with science and so with nature. Which is, as the Asunda conceived them, E.P. tells us, cannot exist. Not that he doesn't say do not exist, as in, you know, I'm certain they do not exist, but cannot exist. It is impossible. This was the point on which uh, the Wittgensteinian Peter Winch caught EP. Systematically exchanging the words sound in European, mystical and scientific, Winch gives us the following version of a passage of, on page 319 of Witchcraft Oracles and Magic. And I quote, Europeans observe the action of the poison oracle just as Sunday observe it, but their observations are always subordinated to their beliefs and are incorporated into their beliefs and made to explain them and justify them. Let us Sunday consider any argument that would utterly refute all European skepticism about the power of the oracle. If it were translated into European modes of thought, it would serve to support their entire structure of belief, but their scientific notions are eminently coherent, being interrelated by a network of logical ties and are so ordered that they never too crudely contradict scientific experience, but instead, experience seems to justify them. The European is immersed in a sea of scientific notions, and if he speaks about the Sunday under poison oracle, he must speak in a scientific idiom. Key here, of course, is that in Wittgenstein's sense, both Sunday and Europeans are following rules of games constitutive of their respective forms of life. It just so happens that the games in question are structured by different rules. E.P. seemed unable to let go of what Wittgenstein would call a hinge proposition of his own form of life, a proposition on which doubt can turn, but which can never fall into doubt itself. That proposition was that science delivers descriptions of the world that, unless falsified by better science, are universally true. In fact, in Collingwood's sense, it wasn't even a proposition but an absolute presupposition, a non-falsifiable foundation on which falsifiable propositions can build. Bringing the scandal posed by witchcraft oracles and magic to such a boil caused Winch much trouble with his philosopher colleagues who scandalized him in the first round of the so-called rationality debate. But what is at issue for me here is of course not the old relativist bugbear of the rationality debate, it is a question about the feasibility and necessary limitations of ethnography itself. Can we, in Wittgenstein's sense, become unhinged? Let me illustrate this by some ethnographic data from my first field work among practitioners of Afro-Cuban ritual traditions in Miami. For Santeros, our path in life, that is the best possible outcome of our earthly existence, is chosen at birth. It is due to our personal follies that we deviate from it and fall into adversity. Deities and spirits of the dead watch over us as we plod along and may goad us towards the right decisions. All this can be revealed through divination. 
to the oracle, our lives are an open book. Now, as a doctoral student with a precariously small amount of funding, I realized that apart from public possession ceremonies, a regular de Orchard's ritual life would not be observable unless I had the rituals performed for myself. Focusing on divination thus turned into a no-brainer. It was cheap and could be repeated as often as I could afford it. Now, in the eyes of my interlocutors, this would have been an entirely unacceptable procedure. Irre irreverent to both the diviners and to the gods. I did it anyway, and not only thought that I learned something about how divination works, I also got a lot of dire prognostications by diviners who wanted, or so I thought, to rope me into more expensive ritual procedures. Talk about ethnographic doubt and certainty. But I also got some unexpected results. In the summer of 1985, two of my diviner interlocutors, Carlos and Cecilia, independently told me of the spirit of a dead person who was hovering behind me, watching my back, as it were. Both described him as an enslaved African who had lived and died in the Cuban pain fields. Cecilia even supplied me with the name, Tomas. Carlos told me that on a day that I felt depressed, I should down in front of a mirror, smoke a cigar, drink a glass of rum, and then I would surely see him. I tried, but never did. Certainty there was none, doubts of plenty. Now here's the argument that, that I hitched my muerto Tomas to back then. Obviously, for Cecilia and Carlos, the idea that Tomas had driven me to their doorstep was an entirely reasonable explanation for why a young German would be barging in upon their lives. For me, it was a matter of resolving my positionality too. The stances we took towards Tomas were proportional to each other. In their case, it was a matter of what Peirce might have called abductive reasoning. In mine, it was that of the author of a book denouncing the violent Atlantic modernity whose heir, like all moderns, I unquestionably am. The idea of someone like Tomas provided me not only with a theory of my own implication in the subject of my inquiries, but set a signpost for the limits of historical representation, for the truly shocking anonymity of millions of enslaved lives systematically wasted on Caribbean sugar plantations literally demands spectral forms of evidence to document the undocumentable. Thomas, in other words, became an analytical device. To be sure, recalling him into my book was also part of an ethical project to give the unknown dead a space in the world whose heir I am. But I left it at that back then and have been rightly criticized for doing so by a younger cohort of ethnographers of Afro-Cuban ritual practices. For at the core of my mobilization of Tomas still lay the idea that he really stood for something else. A reminder, for example, of the haunted nature of a global capitalist modernity that strains to disavow its victims. Not that I think this interpretation was necessarily wrong. Still, this aboutness is a bit of a red herring if we simply leave it at that. But there is another way of dealing with Tomas. After sufficiently long stints of fieldwork, many of us have learned to inhabit worlds furnished rather differently from our own. Something in human nature seems to predispose us to such a capacity that enables the ethnographic gesture in the first place. Rao calls this our species-specific capacity for transcendence, something we acquire in the process of ontogenetic intersubjective attunement that turns human organisms into persons and so makes social life possible to begin with. As Collingwood puts it, self-consciousness makes, and I quote, self-consciousness makes a person of what, apart from that, would simply be a sentient organism. The discovery of myself as a person is the discovery that I can speak and am thus a persona or a speaker. In speaking, I am both a speaker and a hearer. And since the discovery of myself as a person is also the discovery of other persons around me, it is the discovery of speakers and hearers other than myself, end of quote. It is the discovery of a world, which for us can only be a social intersubjective one. But here's the ethnographer's dilemma. We can learn to sit on the other's chairs, turn the handle of his or her door, even learn their metaphysical ideas, alien as they may seem to us, and appreciate their specific affordances and limitations. But can we ever bring the furniture of other people's worlds home and home intact? And what would home then look like? When Wittgenstein's terms, 
can we accommodate more than one language game in our own form of life, beholding the rules of ours in abeyance? EP didn't think so. And that's too bad, perhaps. Arguably, the whole nonsense of the so-called rationality debate could have been avoided had he been more reflexive about the world that he inhabited as an Oxford Don. In Isabel Stengel's uh, terms, the ecology of practices that have been Oxford anthropology during EP's days simply did not admit such questions. Now, proponents of the so-called ontological turn might argue that it is precisely in the such questions that the future of our discipline must lie. Goal no longer being to grasp the native's point of view, but to be grasped by it. Now, to me, this all, that's all fine, and most good ethnographers ought to be presumed to have done so all along. Would witchcraft, oracles, and magic have generated the furor among logical positivist philosophers that it did, had this been the case? As for me, I did not experience any cognitive dissonance when writing Thomas into my book. After all, most of us, including our interlocutors, have been living in what Descola calls hybridized ontologies for the longest time. But is it only the idea of someone like Thomas that is at issue here? And here we come to a difficult juncture. For in rendering Thomas part of the scaffolding of the mind that wrote my book, Wizards and Scientists, did I not give him reality as part of my own being in the world? Were I to say, take seriously the implications of the ideas of my Miami interlocutors, then I could even rephrase this question in a more radical way. For under such a description, I might well not truly be the sole author of whatever I wrote about Thomas and about a whole lot else. And that's where things might become unhinged. For example, when it comes to the form of life that earns me my living. For entertaining this supposition negates a good part of how, for example, the University of Chicago Press treats me as an unproblematically self-contained skin-bound author when it comes to their catalog or to royalty and tax issues. On such terms, in other words, Palmier, perhaps really on a, only an assemblage of sorts, might come undone and reveal itself instead as a precariously maintained island of stability carved out of a multiplicity of emergent and transforming relations, the result of a cut into the network of distributed minds and agencies. How can that be? Now, I'm not rehearsing here the tired old death of the author argument championed by Foucault or Bart. What I want to get at instead is the core of the ethnographic enterprise itself, namely the entailments of inviting Thomas to occupy the position of a meta person in the kind of intersubjective relationality that, as Donald Davidson argued, constitutes the bottom ground of any kind of knowledge of our own thinking, let alone our knowledge of any external world or of other minds. As Davidson puts it, it takes two to triangulate between self, world, and other. And then he adds, two or, of course, more. Now, can I say that I have come to know any more about any or all of this, myself, the world, other minds, after Cecilia and Carlos inserted Tomas into my world? The answer is yes. I haven't made their absolute uh, presuppositions my own. Instead, my accepting Tomas as a meta person towards which I oriented myself eventually allowed me to exchange perspectives on and so participate in the reality of something that distinctly is not part of the world that I inhabit as a member of the University of Chicago's anthropology department, a green card holder in the United States, a person under lockdown because of COVID-19, or any other such aspect of my day-to-day -day social being. All 1980s worries about textual authority and lack of dialogicality in ethnographic writing notwithstanding, a post-representationalist stance reveals these to be utterly misconstrued answers to a problem still very much in search of what William James called the truth that comes to a sentence. This occurs not when a supposedly superior form of cogitation or analysis reveals how things really are, truly and universally, it occurs when shifts in temporally mutable sets of absolute presuppositions generate new sets of temporally and culturally variable hinges. Now, Wittgenstein never bothered to present any coherent considerations about how such hinges might change within one and the same language game, and Collingwood devoted little more than a footnote to the question of how one might conceive of the causes of the, such change. 
His vague remarks about pressures or strains in received constellations of absolute presuppositions have often been taken to presage Michael Polanyi or Thomas Kuhn's thesis about incommensurability. But while the history and philosophy of science may be a guide to the changing platforms on which ethnographic games of doubt and certainty evolve and sometimes radically transform, they do not take the sting out of the necessarily instable nature of the absolute presuppositions that inform our relations to our interlocutors and the worlds they inhabit. I do not know how Wittgensteinian hinges are discoverable. Perhaps we just find them serendipitously or discover them with hindsight. What I've tried to do is recount an engagement with one such hinge that differed enough from those around which my everyday doubts tend to turn so as to make me externalize and objectify what precisely other such hinges might be. We owe EP tribute for alerting us to this problem, but we ought to extend Davidsonian charity when it comes to understanding the intellectual cul de sac that not just he, but his philosophical interpreters led us into a generation or two ago. Just like Kuhn had no problems describing pre copernian views of the world in a language saturated with post-Newtonian mechanics, so we can look at back at classic ethnographies or even at our own and wonder how our disciplinary forebears, or indeed we ourselves, could have ever thought that way. The answer is simple. Our predecessors in the game of ethnographic doubt and certainty, and we, inherited worlds that were brought to us by those who made us into what we are. With all the doubts and certainties, such worlds afforded them then and afford us now. Such worlds and their attendant concerns change. And if we can take a page out of Collingwood and Wittgenstein's books, then we might as well consider our task as ethnographers as providing the best possible description of human worlds or forms of life in reflexive relation to ours, given the horizon of our present but changing absolute presuppositions. Chang chances are we might make some unexpected finds and so contribute to changing the game. Thank you. Uh, good evening, all. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be on this uh, plenary session. And I want to thank Joao Pina Cabral very warmly for his invitation, as well, of course, as the uh, officers and staff of EASA. Years ago, uh, just before Philippe and I, Philippe Descola and I, traveled to Ecuador for an extended period of fieldwork among the Kibero and Achuar, we went to see Claude Levi Strauss, our thesis supervisor, for a final briefing. We explained to him in tedious detail what exactly we were planning to do, when, how, and with what aims in mind. After a, after a while, he waved a hand dismissively and said, yes, yes, that's fine, and rose to see us out. At the door, he added with a characteristic shrug and ironic half smile, laissez-vous porter par le terrain. Just let yourself be carried by the field. Since then, um, I've often thought about the meaning of that valediction, and in this brief paper, I'll follow Levi Strauss's recommendation by allowing myself to be carried, and probably carried away, by his formulation of it. Retrospectively, I understand Levi Strauss to have meant, let yourself be guided to whatever is of central interest to the people you work with. I won't go into my reasons for thinking that this interpretation of Livy Strauss's intended meaning is not entirely fanciful, because I want to focus here on its implicit premise, namely that the people we work with, the natives, whoever they may be, must harbor something in the nature of a desire for engaging with the ethnographer in order to lead her to those elements of their culture they most value, and that they share to some degree the anthropologist's capacity to objectify, to stand at a distance from, their culture. The practice of anthropology in that view would be the art of detecting and tuning in to the desire for ethnography. So the question then becomes, what is the nature of the native's anthropological desire and what are its sources? What kind of unhinging are they aspiring to when they consent to it? It's a remarkable fact that we have no ready answer to these questions. For all the discipline's obsession with reflexivity and its incessant quest for new fields of inquiry, 
it has yet to produce an empirically grounded in-depth study of the experience of being the subject of an ethnographical investigation. Still, despite uh, this absence, we are not without some elements of response to the question I've just raised. Since the reflexive turn of the late 70s, much has been said, of course, uh, about the textual representation of the ethnographic relation, about uh, its pragmatics, about the ethical and political issues it involves. Yet, however dialogic these discourses claim to be, they do not tell us or only hint at how their native interlocutors understood what an ethnographic inquiry is about, what kinds of reflexivity about their culture it triggered, in short, how they conceptualized the relation between their I and the we they were taken to stand for, and how the I of the ethnographer related to his or her we. These are things that can only be guessed at, inferred by abduction, Ginsburg style, from the traces deposited both in the written texts finally produced, in the stories anthropologists tell each other about their field experiences, in fiction, as Ashley will remind us, and increasingly in the native productions that have emerged in the aftermath of the ethnographic experience. But first, a quick word about the setting within which the ethnographic relation unfolds. Invariably, our native informants are all deeply worried people, worried both by the threat of unwanted change hanging over their lifeways and by the implication for them of standing between two worlds. Because worry is becoming a global predicament, now more so than ever, of course, we tend to forget that it has long been a defining feature of our subjects in every sense of that word. Since its beginnings, anthropology has always worked preferentially with people who had and still have very good reason to be worried about the spread of modernity and who long before us have lived through the collapse of the future, to quote Ardener. This primary orientation of anthropology toward people who are collectively experiencing existential disquiet does lead one to wonder whether worried subjects are in fact necessary for the practice of anthropology. Would it be stretching things to claim that being in a state of trouble about the disjointed condition of the lived world is a requisite for the emergence of the desire for ethnography, itself a precondition for the unfolding of the ethnographic relation? It may be a posit here to remember Levi Strauss's narrative, or parable rather, of his visit to the Mundi in chapter 31 of Triste Tropique. These Indians were in 1938 an anthropologist's dream, an uncontacted group promising the exceptional chance of actually living the inaugural moment of anthropology and carrying out first contact ethnography. But the experience was a bitter failure. Though the Mundi showed no hostility towards their visitors, they offered them no sign of a willingness to communicate and evinced no interest in engaging with them. As Levi Strauss tells it, it was like coming up against a glass wall. He and the Mundi could see each other, but nothing happened between them. Nothing happened, according to him, because these Indians were still oblivious of the looming presence of history as it is produced by whites and had not yet been distanced, distanced from themselves by its workings. In a word, they were still too unworried to feel any desire for ethnography. And of course, our subjects are not the only ones to be worried. Long before our own future began to collapse and worry over climate change, the threat of pandemics, the growth of inequality, and the inexorable expansion of commodification, before all this became a universally shared mood, anthropologists have always been existentially troubled people drawn to their vocation by some sense of unease with or distance from their own society as well as their place in it and practicing their discipline with an inbuilt reflexive pessimism. This they carry into the field, itself of course the ultimate disquieting experience, and something of this multi-layered unease is inevitably perceived, however equivocally, by the people we study. This then would seem to be the paradigmatic setting of the ethnographic relation. 
an encounter between people who are worried for different but sometimes partially converging reasons, who experience and express unease in different ways, and who are aware of their interlocutor's disquiet, however they choose to interpret its origin. A shared sense of worry, albeit fraught with ambiguity, actually makes for a good meeting ground in pragmatic terms because it implies the possibility of empathy combined with a degree of wariness about each other's moral dispositions, a suspicion further compounded by the language problem, regardless of how great or small the differences may be between the speech usages of the anthropologist and his hosts. Still, we know that linguistic incomprehension is no barrier to communication. And in fact, it also has its upside. It makes room for time, play, deceit, and ambivalence. And of course, it focuses the attention of all parties concerned on the issue of translation. Now, some of the reasons why it might be desirable to engage with an anthropologist are obvious enough. We're all at least partially aware during fieldwork of the uses we may be put to by our hosts as pawns in local power games, as witnesses to be produced in dealings with state or international agencies, as guarantors of the fact that they possess a culture and are thus entitled to certain rights and benefits and so forth. But there is clearly something more than considerations of political opportunism at play in the natives' consent to the presence of an ethnographer. Using the anthropologist as an idiot utile does not necessarily entail a willingness to engage in any form of transduction. Indeed, such uses could well work, and sometimes do, as a strategy for tightening the boundaries of cultural intimacy and refusing to participate in the work of translation. Given their worry over the uncertainty of what is happening to them in the world, surely part of a native's desire for ethnography lies in the fact that it offers them an opportunity for close first-hand observation of a representative of the world that is causing their worry. In other words, for conducting reverse ethnography and trying to get a handle on what is of central interest for whites. This kind of research mirroring our own inquiries is something that we do not always, that we are not always aware of during fieldwork, and that at best we come to perceive much later uh, once uh, we start analyzing what our ethnographic experience has done to our language and our concepts. The Hiberon Achuar of Western Amazonia I began to work with in the late 70s, my natives of reference, were clearly nonplussed by questions about their customs because at that time they did not know they possessed a culture, although they had begun to grasp that culture uh, lay at the core of what the whites saw as the primary factor of differentiation between them and the natives. One of the main reasons uh, for their perplexity rested in the fact that while we anthropologists seem to think that their particularity lay in what they thought and in the reasons for their practices, they assume that our particularity as whites lay in the nature of our bodies. In line with the multinaturalist premises built into their way of construing the world, uh, as initially defined by Viveros de Castro, they held that bodies and their species-specific ethological behavior are the crucial site of difference between kinds, the source of those species way of engaging with and acting on the world. By contrast, what we term culture was for them a locus of non-differentiation since all beings, human or non-human, who can see themselves as humans necessarily possess a language, the knowledge required to sustain their life ways, to perform rituals, to interact in the proper manner. In other words, have culture, a generic, universal feature of humans that as such cannot be the source of their bodily incarnated difference. This is why Amazonian Indians, as all their ethnographers can testify, are so interested in our bodies and the way they function. As has been said, their sociology is a physiology. Thus, what we eat, how we walk, sleep, defecate, make love, quarrel, these are all vital clues to essential distinctiveness. In short, 
While we are observing them as ethnographers, they are observing us as naturalists. Amazonian natives are acutely interested not only in observing what white bodies habitually do, to further explore their particularities, they seek to try them out. Thus, to get a handle on white's obsession with culture as a principle of differentiation, they test some of the white bodily practices they see the ethnographer performing, or perhaps more accurately, they try to perform indigenous practices they see as commensurable with white practices, as if they were performed by white bodies. Thus, it should come as no surprise that the Namiquara chief undertook in the experimental vein to reproduce the act of writing, or that the Caduveo engaged with the anthropologist by offering him their drawings of facial tattooing. Such mimetic performances clearly play an important role in the elaboration of our ethnographic reports. A telling example is that of Antonio Guzman, Reichel Dolmatov's Desana assistants. By his own account, he equated the kind of knowledge sought by anthropologists with the specialized knowledge on myths and ritual acts held by Desana savants. And by assisting Reichel, he set out to become simultaneously an indigenous savant and an anthropologist. The kind of works being currently produced by indigenous people offers further abundant testimony of the reciprocal mimesis involved in the ethnographic relation. In short, much of what we present as culture actually stem from the acts of commensuration carried out by our native hosts in response to our own operations of commensuration. To sum up, while we are busy imagining a culture for people who don't, do not imagine it for themselves, as Roy Wagner memorably phrased it, they are engaged in a parallel endeavor to get at what is really of central interest to the ethnographer and the collective he stands for. In this sense, the native and the anthropologist are, as Hertzfeld put it, engaged in directly comparable intellectual operations. For example, the kinds of reflexivity involved in these parallel but different anthropologies are not as similar as are the problems of translation um, these parallel but different anthropologies, um, uh, um, sorry, uh, for example, the kinds of reflexivity involved in these parallel but different anthropologies are no doubt similar, as are the problems of translation they are linked to. Hanks and Severi have recently reminded us that translation is a permanent process in any and every culture, is in fact the stuff of what we call culture and is necessarily tied to specific kinds of reflexivity, since beyond the automatic reflexivity built into any form of interaction with another, the internal switching of codes and registers constitutive of culture implies some form uh, of mental objectivation of both the source and the target. What is specific to the ethnographic context is that these kinds of translation become problematic because neither party involved knows what the other knows or doesn't know. This context leads to a further kind of reflexivity of a non-ordinary sort, perhaps similar in some ways to varieties of ritual reflexivity because of the weight of perplexity it involves. However, direct similarity of mental operations as Viveros de Castro forcefully reminds us, does not mean direct translatability, because the framing of these intellectual processes can be quite distinct, hinging on sharply divergent, unquestioned premises about what it is to be human, to communicate, to think, to aggregate in societies, or to possess culture. What I'm trying to say is, in a nutshell, that reflexivity about one's own shared life forms and therefore about others is a built-in feature of culture in general and that the affordance offered by the ethnographic relation is the possibility of giving a shape, always historically situated, to this reflexivity. This means that ethnography is fundamentally 
an exercise in translating indigenous modes of translation. It also means that the desire for ethnography is inextricably linked to political imaginaries. In the Amazonian context, the kind of reflexivity triggered by wondering what the ethnographer is really interested in and, uh, and why feeds on lowland Indians' predisposition to value difference over sameness and thus to aspire to some kind of relation with outsidedness. There are two sides to this gravitation toward alterity, both of which have been abundantly discussed in Amazonianist literature. One side is the drive to capture elements of alterity, names, trophies, songs, live or dead beings, and so forth, considered necessary for social biological reproduction. The other side is the impulse to become other, to change into and experience another type of corporality, a metamorphosis that contains affiliating with the collective this type of body belongs to. This is what shamans do, and it is also a process that is salient in war-related ritual performances, where the killer may gradually morph into the enemy, assume the position of a god, or become a supernatural animal. This aspiration to become other is also evident in the ample record dating back to pre-conquest times of outbreaks of millenarist movements, generally implying a radical shift away from ordinary or customary practice and behavior, and while many of them seem to be initiated by persons who are marginal to the group or stand at least partially outside it, they do not necessarily require the presence of a prophet figure. Such movements testify to the importance and permanence of Amazonians' readiness to try out different ways of inhabiting and acting on the world. This rich mental stock of alternative ways of life evidently forms a central strand of the relation they develop with their ethnographers, insofar as the ethnographic situation triggers the memory of the imaginaries feeding these movements, the nostalgie du futur that inhabits them. And this inevitably combines or collides with the nostalgia for the past that is built into anthropology. Nostalgia is not only a mood common to many anthropologists, it is parceled into the discipline's toolkit in that we routinely rely on comparison between past and present states of the society under study to understand the nature and direction of the changes that have affected it. Thus, while Amerindians compare their present to an imagined future, we use the past, theirs and sometimes ours, as a resource for imagining an alternative world for ourselves. However equivocally shared, this joint aspiration for a different kind of difference is what I believe ultimately lies at the heart of the desire for ethnography. Thank you. Hello, I hope you can hear me because I had my mic muted. Um, but first um, I want to thank Joan Jupina Cabral and the local EASA organizing committee for inviting me to be part of this plenary. It is a privilege to be commenting on such rich papers. My remarks begin where these two papers meet, though I move them just a touch beyond their stated positions. While Anne Christine discusses encounters with difference and the translations of translations, and Stefan speaks of them as always potentially passable doors, I want to read Stefan and Anne Christine as helping us think about untranslatability, impassibility, indeed impossibility, as a vital part of ethnography and of relating more generally. This is important, especially at this time of new limits, as Joan described it earlier. Specifically, I want to conceive of limits, impossibility, not as a lament or indicative of a permanent or new crisis, but instead as a way to humbly ground our relations and knowledge. Of course, I'm unhinging nothing really, to borrow Stefan's language, by saying that passing through doors doesn't mean you will arrive or to say that ethnography and relating more generally is inevitably hard, partial, and will never end up being what we expect. But while we know that the unpredictability of ethnography is deemed a good thing, there remains a stigma associated with untranslatability and impossibility. 
So my aim here is to recuperate them a bit, first by emphasizing their presence in our text today, and then by discussing Brazil's most untranslatable novel, which I'm reading alongside my own research in settler Amazonia. Can we become unhinged, Stefan asks, and concludes that the spirit of Tomas is rather more like a door open to him and that he has still not stopped believing that him or someone like him, quote, might be able to step through this door even if none of us ever really will succeed in doing so, end quote. This phrase of the longer paper immediately brought to mind the, the impassable door of the law in Kafka's fam famous parable. Stefan and I subsequently had a lively conversation about it, which became a footnote, where Stefan gives a gloss of the parable and responds, I quote, a man from the country aiming to get entry into the law, these are Kafka's terms, confronts a gatekeeper at an open gate who tells him again and again that he cannot step through just now. The gatekeeper finally reveals to the, dead, to the dying man that the entrance was assigned to him alone and closes the gate. As should be clear, and this is still Stefan speaking, I am not partial to such a fatalistic reading. So, end quote. Stefan's stated distance from Kafka is why I read him a bit beyond where he puts himself. In fairness, in our conversation, Stefan was quick not to think of Kafka as only dark. Yet while writing these comments, I recalled the significance of another part of the parable. At the beginning, the man asks the gatekeeper if he will be allowed to enter later. I quote from Kafka. It is possible, says the gatekeeper, but not now. The gate to the law stands open as always, so the man bends over to see through the gate into the inside. The gatekeeper laughs and says, if it tempts you so much, try in spite of my prohibition, but take note, I am powerful and I am only the most lowly gatekeeper. But from room to room stand gatekeepers, each more powerful than the other. I can't endure even one glimpse of the third. The man from the country decides to wait until he gets permission. So what is remarkable here and what does seem like the utmost fatalism is that Kafka sees the law as infinitely protected by doors with gatekeepers, that no matter what, the man, him, us will never even arrive. But still, as some scholars have concurred, the real tragedy, even for Kafka, may just be that he never even gets through the first door, because he never tries to get in. This is not a comment on Stefan, as he certainly tries and hopes to get through his door. Rather, I want to point out the parable's lesson, that of course, it might be impossible to ever get fully, exactly where we want to go, but that shouldn't stop us from trying. I don't ultimately think that my reading of the parable or of the ethnographic relation is that far from Stefan's, who has himself elsewhere embraced the conditions of impossibility of historicist knowledge. But here I do land just a bit more on the side of un impossibility and untranslatability. And this allows me to swing back to Anne Christine, whose paper I also push a bit more towards that position as well. So Anne Christine sees ethnography as a translation of translations made possible by a mutual desire for ethnography by anthropologist and interlocutor, which is grounded on mutual misunderstanding. To extend this, I playfully offer a rereading of what initiated her reflections, a suggestion she first received in a pre-fieldwork visit with her doctoral advisor, Lévi-Strauss. Let yourself be carried by the field, Lévi-Strauss said. While her interpretation led to her reflection on the desire for ethnography, it also inspired her to call for a study of the experience of ethnographic investigation to understand especially what degree of unhinging our interlocutors are aspiring and consenting to. I actually think that there exists something like such a study, untranslatable though it is. But first, let me turn to Levi Strauss's suggestion. Could Levi Strauss not also be suggesting that we allow ourselves to be carried by the field right to its very edge, to the limits of classification, that is carried to the impossibility of apprehension and the fundamental untranslatability that generates transformation? Of course, I consider this to be just another version of Anne Christine's suggestions, precisely because at least one of the edges of the field is the other, as she notes. 
But it is worth acknowledging more generally that in La Pensée Sauvage, another untranslatable title, Lévi-Strauss primed anthropologists on the impossibility at the heart of knowledge and life, even of history, when he said that, a less, socially interest, that less socially interested historians tend to model, quote, a confused outline of Gödel's theorem in the clay of becoming, end quote. Here, Lévi-Strauss was not opposed to history as such, as has often been said of him. By recalling Gödel's theorem of incompleteness, which holds that even in complete systems, some things will remain impossible to prove, Lévi-Strauss was reminding us that while it is impossible to know everything, the very existence of impossibility means that things can change. An encounter with impossibility, an event at the limit of classification, provokes a necessary response. The production of further classifications, the proliferation of differences, resulting in transformation. Before post-structuralism proper then, impossibilities, perennial encounters with difference, were at the heart of Lévi-Strauss's thinking, not only on anthropology, but on history as well. Lévi-Strauss's encounter with the two different mundé, to which Anne-Christine also refers, helps concretize Lévi-Strauss's work with impossibility. Boris Wiseman describes it as a moment when Lévi-Strauss realizes that the ethnographic project is an impossibility, yet classifies this as a negative moment in Lévi-Strauss's work that is nevertheless temporary. Certainly, Lévi-Strauss is feeling deflated, concluding that no one and no thing from humans to grass can be fully apprehended in their otherness, that it is either the relation that transforms the other or indeed the self who can never really leave home and truly see the other. But the sheer negativity associated with impossibility and scholars like Wiseman's particular aversion to it comes from perhaps a Euro-American faith in and desire for limitlessness, perfection, unity, transparency, translatability, and sameness, which makes anything that is too dissimilar from those hopes appear negative and thus to be opposed. This fear of the irremediably dissimilar is quite pernicious, including politically, as Marilyn Strathern has long argued and has recently expanded upon in her new book, Relations. Yet my own path to this persuasion also passes through what I earlier called Brazil's most untranslatable novel, which has not only helped me think through my own research in settler Amazonia, but also approximates what Anne Christine calls for, a study of the experience of ethnography and how to write about it. This most untranslatable novel, Lusophones will be unsurprised to hear, is João Guimarães Rosa's Grande Sertão Veredas, published in 1956. It is also Brazil's, and indeed one of the Portuguese languages, star contributions to world literature. The problem is that the world doesn't quite know it yet because the book is essentially untranslatable. Gregory Habasa, the celebrated American translator of 100 Years of Solitude and others, said that Grande Sertão, quote, would have to be rewritten, not translated, end quote. Of course, the book has been variously translated and rather flatly in English as the devil to pay in the backlands. But the translations fail to communicate Rosa's astounding linguistic innovation from confounding neologisms to cascading rhythms. Precisely because of its untranslatability, it should be classified as a classic of anthropological thought. I'm certainly not the first anthropologist to think with Grande Sertão, I think of Carlos Brandão, Ana Cláudia Marques, João de Pina Cabral here. But so far as I know, the novel has not been taken as an opportunity to reflect on ethnographic experience and method generally. Therefore, it bears mentioning in this forum where many can or have read it in the original. Grande Sertão is, gra is grounded in Rosa's admittedly brief fieldwork in Brazil's arid interior, the Sertão. It can thus be read as an account of both the results and effects of his ethnographic engagement. The story is built around questions the narrator Riobaldo poses to an outsider, though we never actually hear this outsider respond. Riobaldo seems to want his interlocutor to help him decide the undecidables, especially, for example, resolving the existence of the devil. But ultimately, Riobaldo cannot decide. 
because this is what drives him to relate and thus get closer to himself and the divine. And this desire is ultimately what drives the story too. So Riobaldo says, and I pardon the translation, sir, you help me talk more with myself. Look, see what is bad inside us. We always pervert by, come, by becoming distant from ourselves. Perhaps this is why people like to talk. Your ideas, sir, give me peace. The confirmation that the thing doesn't exist. Right, no? But Heobaldo continues to wonder, quote, who knows, maybe the native badness of man makes him only capable of seeing the approximation of God in the figure of the other, end quote. The other Riobaldo refers to here is surely the devil. Indeed, clearly the devil could be any others or selves. And this is actually exactly what some people told me during my own field work when many others said, quote, of course the devil exists, we just don't believe in him. But as Riobaldo speculates, perhaps the devil is the only way to the divine? Here, the resonance with Amerindian engagements with enmity could be interesting to contemplate. This brings me to my final point. I don't want us necessarily to champion Christianity, but we could learn with it. First, by remembering the role of Christianity in colonization, a tragic process precisely where radical difference, indeterminacy, untranslatability was deemed a tragedy, an outgrowth of the fall, a cause and source of evil to be eradicated. This echoes in even contemporary settler, secular Euro-American fears of difference. Yet Heobaldo, my interlocutors, and certainly Rosa, don't always see the untranslatable as unknowable or unknowable as tragic. They see it as a fact of life, as well as beautiful in its mystery. And we can learn a lot from that too. Perhaps learning from all the people here discussed, we can also acknowledge that irremediable, ultimately impossible to bridge difference, whether in others or in selves, at home or away, can be beautiful, humbling, and transformative? Might we conclude then that ethnographers should remain, should remain determined to transform with the untranslatable truths of others? Thank you. Hello, back again. Didn't I tell you? After these three papers, it's it's hard to um, not to take one's time to think. Each one of them addressed our issue from a totally different angle, um, but with an enormous richness and with a kind of conjunction in the sort of problems that maybe not just the three of us, but most of us around here at this moment are actually experiencing not a sense of frustration with our capacity to perform our task as social scientists or as anthropologists, but uh, an awareness of the possibility of richness of exploring the borders of those possibilities. And I think that's where all these, these different, these three different takes for me, that's how they inspired me, because they gave me a sense that um, our, our uh, engagement with the world um, as social scientists um, need not assume um, that entanglement is not the basic condition of the world. <laughs> we have to reduce entanglement, we have to determine, but we don't have to believe that it's no longer there. Right, so I'm going to ask the, the uh, people in the audience to raise their hands, please. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a feature that says raise hands. And I'm going to ask you, please, to um, uh, uh, raise your hands in order to make a question or a comment uh, for the speakers. Uh, I, I will take two or three, and then they, they can answer, and then we'll go back again. So please, anybody, um, if you are uh, willing to, to do so, do, make a, do, do raise your hand by pressing the hand 
figure at the bottom. All right, so we have uh, 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 the first person was Susanna Viegas, and then we have uh, Klaus Sledenik, sorry if I'm not pronouncing you right, um, from Riga. So please, Susanna, from Lisbon. Hello. So uh, <clears throat> this is more of a comment, is actually to see if uh, Anne Christine can, in some way, make a comment on the. Um, the the reading that Ashley has just done of what she was saying because I really thought her her suggestion of using the idea of desire for engagement and this idea that uh, it is important to notice what it is is the native desire for ethnography instead of trying to see the kind of political or reciprocity that can be managed between anthropologists. And instead of thinking of translations, um, despite the fact that she quotes translations in her discourse, seems to be, for my point of view, a much better uh, um, position even to consider the current situation uh, where indigenous people are in this moment. Exactly because for them it became so uh, important to differentiate because between those with whom they could engage in those with whom they could not engage in the world mm -hmm. uh, because they are committing genocide against them. So I really would like to listen more of uh, Anne Christine's idea of this desire for engagement as a basis for to think of how to construct knowledge in ethnography. Thank you very much. That is a very good question. Clevs, then, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, for these uh, very interesting um, papers. Uh, but I was wondering, do we, were, uh, we heard a lot uh, about the um, uh, um, anthropologists and their native uh, uh, interlocutors uh, who uh, apparently live in, in some far away places uh, in very uh, perhaps simple conditions. Uh, but uh, in contemporary anthropology, and that's what we are teaching to, to our students, is and what is the, the, the fact of our uh, anthropological lives, is that more and more uh, anthropologists uh, are not going um, to any kind of distant lands, but actually their interlocutors and, uh, and what they work with are uh, people from their own, um, um, own environment. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering uh, what, um, uh, what this changes in uh, all, uh, all the um, uh, assumptions that, uh, that we, were, uh, we heard here today. Thank you. These are very good questions. If we had uh, uh, another one or another two, uh, uh, Rohan, that might not be a bad idea. And then we could let the, the, the speakers uh, reply. So uh, Berlin Lower from Humboldt State University says, um, uh, uh, made a question that I would like to hear the final speaker expand on the thoughts about the untranslatable or unknowable not being tragic. It's a good question too. So I will, on that line, pass the the, the screen to our uh, three speakers, please, Rowan, and hear them um, reply to these three questions. Stefan, would you like to? Okay. Um, well, I think I can I can speak to uh, the second question to some extent, because uh, I mean, uh, after all, uh, due to the fact that uh, field work in Cuba wasn't really possible in the 1980s, I mean, after they had thrown out Oscar Lewis, uh, foreigners were largely banned, and we, we actually. Um, I got a grant denied because uh, you know the reviewers were uh, rightly arguing that I would be interested in my interlocutors uh, as a foreigner. But uh, but you know so the, so by default I did my first 
ethnographic field work in Miami. And, you know, Miami is, uh, you know, arguably a different place than, uh, than Munich, where I was uh, living then. But, you know, it's a large American city. And um, I really do not think that uh, any of my, um, I mean, or let me put it differently. Uh, research there prior on you know, matters of Afro-Cuban religion had largely concentrated on the ideas that these uh, ritual practices served in a kind of a Malinovskian way as alleviating um, anxieties to do with the fact that they couldn't rationally deal with uh, their predicaments in a foreign society, uh, undergoing a cultural racial related stress and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, I, I was expecting to find, uh, you know, somewhat disturbed people there. But uh, as it turned out, you know, the ones who were suffering from acculturation related stress were actually white Anglos, because by that point, Cubans actually owned Miami, more or less. And, uh, and so in a sense, um, you know, certainly, I wasn't studying people like myself. But I was, you know, and, and in Cuba, too, I mean, Cuba is by no means uh, kind of uh, an exotic place. I mean, it has its uh, very specific features and, uh, you know, they compare to living situations in, um, you know, pre-1989 parts of Eastern Europe, uh, you know, with, you know, state security, with, you know, people denouncing each other with scarcities and, and so on and so forth. So I actually, at that point, um, you know, I, living through the worst years of the so-called special period in times of peace in the 1990s, I exchanged uh, experiences of going hungry with my father, who had, uh, you know, grown up in, in the post-war years in, in Germany and did experience hunger. So, so there was, you know, in many ways, nothing terribly uh, for me uh, alien about uh, these places. It was just that people with whom I chose to work had somewhat different ideas of, you know, how the world works and, you know, what kind of um, forces and agencies uh, animated. Um, it doesn't really fully answer your question, but, uh, you know, one could think about, um, you know, working with, um, you know, as in science and technology studies with, uh, you know, people who inhabit, uh, you know, I, I must confess, like most of us, I think, uh, you know, um, I still inhabit uh, a world uh, structured by Newtonian mechanics where, you know, where things just fall down as, as they just happen. And can't quite imagine a curvilinear non-Euclidean space. So, um, you know, that, or, for example, you know, if you think about, um, oh God, what, what's his name? Um, if you think about, uh, you know, some of the work being done with, uh, you know, sort of, um, in laboratories or such, I mean, where uh, sort of uh, our, you know, our common sense ideology and, you know, the one that I tried to expose at the beginning, which, you know, certainly was Evan Spritchard's, uh, suddenly uh, begins to look very exotic. So th that's what I could possibly say about that. Thank you. Very good. Um, please, I'm Christine. Um, yes, I fully agree with what Stephen has just said. This, this idea that uh, it's fundamentally different when we work with people who are the same, <laughs> the same as us. What does it mean to be the same as us? Uh, I think the, the point of anthropology is precisely to, we've often been accused of exotization and so on and so forth. Actually, I'm not against exotization, ex uh, uh, provided it is generalized. In other words, if you are going to study uh, people from your own cultural group or own society, your resource as an anthropologist is precisely to turn them into exotic things and to try and find out what makes them tick, what may, what, uh, how they, how they view the world, construe the world, function in it, act on it, and so on and so forth. Uh, in that sense, I think there is honestly no difference, no basic difference between working in a relatively remote Amazonian group, far less remote now than it used to be in the, in the uh, late 70s, 
uh, or working with uh, white collar uh, workers in a suburb of, uh, of Paris, um, or or with the cadre supérieur for that matter uh, in the same city. Um, it's um, uh, that I mean. I don't think it fundamentally changes the either the task or the methods of anthropology. Just let me just leave it at that. Um, regarding Susanna's question, I'm not quite sure because there was a, a glitch in my communication at the beginning of her intervention. I'm not quite sure I understood the thrust of her of her question. Uh, as I understood it, she was asking if. Um, my take on the desire for ethnography, uh, the natives' desire for ethnography and so on, is still relevant in the present conditions of uh, existence of most Amazonian groups, who are, of course, under terrific pressure, more and more so, uh, as she noted, uh, from national states uh, and, in, in fact, international capitalism and so on and so forth. I think, in a sense, the issue of translation uh, just becomes even more uh, pressing and crucial in, in these circumstances. Uh, it's not a question of just trying to elicit complicated uh, ideas about uh, precisely spirits or this, that, and the other, and so on. It's, it's trying to understand the way they misunderstand us. And that is, of course, a more and more crucial issue nowadays. Uh, and I think uh, issues of uh, translation are, are really, lie really at the heart of what the uh, natives in Amazonia uh, are trying to are trying to get at uh, when they engage with an ethnographer nowadays. For them, obviously, uh, understanding uh, understanding the kind of world they are being faced with is just as essential as it is for us. And therefore, uh, therefore, the issue of trying to translate uh, both themselves uh, to the anthropologist, but also uh, equally the anthropologist and what he stands for um, is for them an absolutely vital, vital business nowadays. But again, I'm not absolutely sure that was her question. So if not, uh, please let her rephrase it. Ashley, would you like to comment? Sure. I, I think I could speak a little bit to the, to the, the political questions. Um, that I think Susanna raised, um, and also um, the, the the question addressed to me, or the kind of question of elaboration: Why is the untranslated woman tragic? So let's just think about kind of politically what. So and and, and rightly so at these moments, right? I mean, and, and kind of communication and and you know being able to interact and make things happen with others, whether at home or abroad or wherever. Um, we would want that to be translatable, right? We would want to have some kind of possibility. However, I mean, I think I think that sets you up for the times where you get into these very dangerous places of not being able to communicate, for things failing. This becomes this ultimate tragedy, right? This, this ultimate failure. I mean, you could think about this on any different scale and I'm being very general right now. Um, but but I, I think, you know, putting store solely in what is possible, right? And then when you reach the, the impossible, that impasse, it kind of all comes apart. I think that that's very, problem, that's very dangerous. I mean, and to put it a little bit more concretely, um, the thought that, that the untranslatable is tragic and bad, um, or the, or, or the, which is the radical other or whatever, um, is it, the radical difference, the unknowable, the impossible is a bad thing that we need to do away with, um, is, is kind of akin, is part of our very worst politics. Mm. That is actually what we need to move away from, this sense that the, the, the unknown, the unknowable and the radically different, um, you know, even though we might not have any radical difference anymore, as John said, whatever you want, but the point is, is that 
is that when we think of difference as bad, as something to be eliminated, as something to, to create transparent communication with, that's, that, that is the, the author, the silent author of our very worst politics. So, so, it, so, so that, that addresses like my position on the political ramifications of the point that I was making. But more particularly, let me just say one thing about Juan Guimarães Rosa's um, work. I mean, and, and very simply to say, you know, it, it's it's untranslatable, and it's it's too bad that not everybody can have access to it in the in the way that it was written. But in fact, it is without the untranslatability of it, which is what he was trying to capture. It wouldn't be as beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there's also something there um, about about that, about the mystery. I mean, maybe that's a Christian thing. I don't know, but you know, there's something about mystery that has value, um, and and the unknowable and the untranslatable. And so there's some there, there, there's a reason to give it value, both kind of in our aesthetic experiences, but also in our political ones. So, I'll leave it there. That was three marvelous answers. I have to say that um, uh, uh, that kind of um, that call for the futuricity of mystery <laughs> that you are making is it really echoes very much with the sort of problems that uh, 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 that often confront us as ethnographers. And um, uh, to go back to the uh, one question, I would like to say as well that um, I have always done field work in contexts where more or less people have spoken my mother language, my mother tongue. Uh, this happened uh, in three different continents, but <laughs> this, but they were speaking something that my mother had taught me to speak when when I first started, um, and so that sense. Um, that uh, Stefan was describing so well of um, uh, uh, of how uh, that confrontation with difference is in a way something that I set up myself um, that might not have been there, but that I have set up myself is part of my experience as an ethnographer, uh, and and I think we should we should attend uh, to that. Um, I, I, I remember recently here in Canterbury um, speaking to this lady to whom I asked, what did you vote in the Brexit uh, vote? And she replied, I vo voted for Brexit. And I said, why? And she replied to me that there were too many polls in England and that that was the reason why she voted for Brexit, which I'm still kind of trying to to twist my mind to understand what she could possibly have meant um, uh, by, by, by taking such an absolutely shattering uh, 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 choice on the basis of, of, of something that is really almost hard to understand. Uh, to me, that was very radically <laughs> different <laughs> from what I could think. Uh, Stefan. Joag, if I can just uh, for a minute, uh, you know, addressing the same issue, uh, point out that when I teach uh, witchcraft, oracles, and magic, uh, I, uh, you know, which of course is full of uh, invisible forces uh, that, uh, you know, wreak havoc on people's lives, I ask my students, uh, and of course nobody's ever seen witchcraft, you know, and so on and so forth, I ask my students to think about the economy in Western societies. Nobody's ever seen the economy, but it makes havoc or, or you know, it has amoral, uh, positive or negative effects on people's lives. And, uh, you know, we can actually, in, in many, uh, the pandemic, you know, uh, the way in which, uh, you know, the invisible for, I mean, you don't have to, that's my point, you don't have to even think about exotic uh, phenomena that we, sometimes classify as religious or, or whatever, and I don't even like that term. But, uh, you know, our worlds are structured by uh, uh, agencies and entities that, uh, you know, are in many ways just as mysterious and, uh, and awe-inspiring as, you know, anything that, you know, my sure. friends tell me in Cuba. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask Rohan, our administrator, to uh, take away the speakers. 
and um, let us raise, let us call in the people that have raised their, their hands in the meantime and then I can see that there are three questions as well so uh, this person should unblock her view um, so Patrick Nolin, yes there you are um, uh, uh, Virginia, there you are, and maybe there is a third, uh, Roa? Okay. Right, and we have Mat uh, Matthias Testuza um, here. So, let's uh, uh, call your comments in order. Um, please, Patrick. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I have a, a, a question. How... how these observations about gender side, about worries, about translation, and so on. How do we shift these to these new terrains of anthropology? Let's say, like a southern German village where people feel really worried about like losing their identity, genocide, because they are like basically very racist people. They are afraid of this kind of what these Nazis call population exchange. They don't accept the German government as a legitimate successor to the German Reich. Um, I, I mean, how do we deal with, with people who have these kind of worldviews and ideas about nativeness and so on with the terminology that we are discussing in this plenary? Um, does the terminology hold? Does it stand the kind of application to these kind of hardcore Nazi groups uh, who could maybe have something like a very Amerindian worldview in Bavaria or something like that? Or do we need a new terminology? Because obviously an increasing part of the world population, and now we can even talk about like people in Ternate after the Indonesian state fell apart, like thinking like they are the, the righteous heritors of the Sultanate and they need to kill all the Christians, stuff like that. So these are not like exceptional cases, but there's millions or hundreds of millions of people in the worst case out there who think that way. Thank you, that's a great question. Now, Virginia Dominguez, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I thought that these presentations were all terrific and very thought-provoking, but they did lead me to wonder about what the three of you were actually suggesting or proposing, because I, I'm thinking about many anthropologists who do ethnography where I don't know if in the field they have doubts, but uh, they, they seem to write with a great deal of certainty whether it's about, uh, oh, I don't know, environmental uh, justice issues, or it's about human rights, or you can think of it. But I guess I'm sort of wondering if, if the three of you were basically uh, recommending, suggesting uh, a way of thinking about ethnography, and whether you think that, that what you were recommending or suggesting or describing is actually uh, what most ethnographers do right now, because I have my own doubts, but but uh, I'll leave it up to you. Mm. Yes. Um, okay, it's my you, turn. Please. Yes. Um, I had a question for all three presenters. I wanted to ask if they reflected on how this uncertainty, this uh, untranslatable might affect the debate on the role of anthropologists after fieldwork in the field of anthrop applied anthropology where when the knowledge co produced is used in worlds where uh, the space for untranslatable does not exist and already anthropology struggled to be accepted by our others as a discipline. Um, thank you. Uh, those are wonderful questions. Now, I wonder whether Rowan has received any questions that are written that he might show us. Stefan's presentation resembles an anthropological version 
of the Munchausen trilemma, often resolved by choice of probable axioms. What is the role of probability in choosing between these different things? I, I didn't see, Rowan, the name of the person. Jonathan Kudzberry from Göttingen. Okay, thank you very much. That was a wonderful um, that was a wonderful question that Stefan will enjoy answering, I'm sure. Uh, could we have the next one, please? So Daniela Guerreiro from the, my own Institute of Social Sciences in Lisbon asks, what's the secret to being a good ethnographer? <laughs> <laughs> like you, Paul. Well. <laughs> well, that was a good question too, in a way. Um, any more? Now, Bernin Lohr again from Humboldt University. Thanks to speakers for excellent feedback on question. I am of this mind as well, but often meet resistance from the non-anthropology culture in the US who expect access to native knowledge and then I didn't see the rest. Um, okay, native knowledge as a right. Yes, the yeah. issue, the issue of right. That is a very important question too. Thank you very much, Rowan. Maybe now we could ask, thank our questioners and, and, and take them off the podium and uh, uh, have answers from our speakers. Should I start? Uh, uh, or, uh, Why don't you start? Uh, they'll take some time to come in. But... Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, the first question, uh, of course, uh, for me, uh, you know, I happen to come from a small southern Bavarian village, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not aware that uh, of much research there. But uh, you might be, uh, if you haven't come across it, you might be interested in uh, hearing that Francesca Merlin, uh, you know, somebody, uh, an eminent student of uh, a native Australian indigeneity, um, did uh, field work uh, just about 20 kilometers from where I grew up. On, uh, on, on questions of indigeneity. So, uh, you know, I can't really say much more about that. Uh, of course, I'm fully aware of, of, of the problem. And, uh, and you know, people, uh, you know, sort of, I think about Sandra Harding, for example, what it means to study the repugnant other. You know, that's, uh, you know, that's one, one issue that comes into play here. Um, the problem uh, with, um, you know, our role, you know, this is more towards uh, Virginia's question, um, as, um, you know, uh, in terms of our public mission, uh, sorely, um, you know, unheard of as our uh, interventions usually are in the public, uh, I'm, you know, I, I don't think any of us aim to uh, directly, uh, you know, address these issues, uh, and they came up in all four questions, as a matter of fact, uh, wanted to, I mean, I, speaking for myself, I just wanted to point out, and this also goes to the Munchausen dilemma, uh, that, um, you know, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the other is just, you know, any other guy that you might run into. I mean, the, the question of other minds uh, in, uh, you know, in British philosophy goes back to this famous debate in, I think, 1941 or 42 between Austin, Wisdom, and uh, I forgot who the third one was. And, uh, you know, if you think about, for example, you know, phenomeno phenomenology or phenomenological uh, sociology, uh, you know, the um, question of, you know, what you know, or how minds could possibly meet is, uh, you know, an unresolved dilemma. And uh, in that case, I think, um, you know, ethnography is, you know, as I think most of us said in one way or the other, is just uh, a way of, you know, trying to push beyond this limit and uh, of, um, you know, of non-transcendence in Joao's terms. Uh, and, uh, you know, here I should should mention that you know the longer version of my paper, uh, you know, had a postscript that uh, Ashley was referring to, because in conversation with a with a friend, uh, he pointed out to me that uh, you know I'm 
my mind may have been bewitched a bit by Wittgenstein's own language, because what hinges usually do in the world is they open and close, help open and close doors. And the question is, can we step through that door? And this is what, you know, Ashley and I uh, were conversing about uh, in, the, um, in this exchange that she uh, referenced. So probability in that regard is probably all that we uh, can bank on. You know, that's, uh, you know, whether, you know, pulling ourselves up. I mean, actually, uh, what was it Barry Barnes who spoke of uh, uh, bootstrapping operations in, uh, in the real world, and including science, of course, since, you know, as a, one of the founding members of the Edinburgh School of Sociology, that would have been his field. I, I can't really remember his argument very well right now, but you might, uh, you might, might want to look that up. Um, the secret to ethnography. I mean, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to venture uh, into that terrain. I mean, it's just probably that you know, it's probably a meeting of desires in on, on Christine's terms, uh, which may be fortuitous in uh, in many situations. Uh, but it's uh, you know, again, it's uh, that kind of. Um, um, it grows, the ethnographic gesture, as Raoul might say, grows out of a kind of a pan-human capacity that we acquire in uh, our very earliest stages of life by trying to, I mean, we're all sort of mind readers, or we become mind readers uh, in everyday life, but we, of course, there's, you know, the barrier is always there. I mean, it's, mind reading is always just an attempt to, uh, and communication is the same. I mean, it's, uh, it's ultimately always risky business. And, um, and that, of course, you know, then, you know, to, to the last question, maybe um, uh, the right to have access to, uh, to knowledge is, uh, you know, it's, it's a very pretentious kind of way of thinking, in, in my view, uh, because, um, or the other's knowledge, that is, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not talking about uh, you know, sort of acquiring uh, skills in mathematics or something like that, but, uh, but it's, um, it's, you know, the, the issue, for example, of esoteric knowledge, which, you know, I uh, do think plays a considerable role in, uh, you know, po political um, confrontations between Native American groups, particularly in North America, and uh, you know, bureaucrats or you know even well-meaning uh, uh, people who uh, work for you know development agencies and, and things like that is um, you know it's a genuine. I mean, Ashley said it very well. I mean, it's you know that's uh, at the in many ways at the foundation sits at the foundations of bad politics. And yeah, maybe I'll just leave it at that. You know. Thank you, Stefan. That was very clear. Okay. And Christine, would you like to say something? Um, the, well, these were very rich questions. I certainly can't address all of them. The, the question of working with repugnant others <laughs> is, uh, is different. Uh, in terms of the ethnographic method, I don't think it changes anything. But obviously, it's... it's, it's it's difficult to work with with people whom you have no sympathy with at all. It's very difficult. Uh, and it's all the more difficult uh, that I don't think you can afford to go in uh, these extreme right groups, for example, in a clandestine way. I think you no anthropologist should should go that way. You have to be honest about what you're doing. And um, they maybe you'll get somewhere by being honest and actually and actually get a glimpse into um, the horrible worldview of these people, which is very useful. And actually, uh, quite a few people are doing it nowadays. Anyway, uh, though they all say it's it's extremely difficult. Um, but once again, in terms of in terms of, uh, of uh, ethnographic methods, language concepts, I don't think it changes fundamentally uh, anything. Uh, I think uh, the, the language of translation, of 
of uh, uh, trying to translate other translations and so on remains valid even in such cases. Uh, the question uh, about certainty or uncertainty, uh, one of our uh, one of the commentaries where was that uh, we seem to uh, go against the grain of much of ethnography, which seems to be written, which to, in her view seems to be written with certainty. Uh, I don't know of much good anthropology, which uh, sounds very certain. In fact, I think one of the good diagnostic traits of what a good anthropology is, is precisely uh, the fact that it's that it exhibits uncertainty uh, about its conclusions, about its uh, analysis and so on. Um, and in fact, um, I think being uncertain is something that we anthropologists uh, have not only to live with, but actually to cultivate um, uh, actively. Uh, how to be a good ethnographer? <laughs> I think it's simply really a question of being ready to be surprised, paying attention, close attention to everything, uh, being led, being allowing yourself to be led into things that will that you can't get your mind around initially in any case and um, uh, how should I put it precisely abdicating any kind of certainty and and uh, welcoming welcoming the unexpected and the surprising and being transformed by it precisely allowing yourself to be allowing yourself to be, because that's basically what anthropology is about. It's, it's a complicated exercise in making ourselves uncertain about ourselves and our own society, really. Uh, so it's a question of, uh, I think, uh, being, uh, uh, being very generous to whatever it is you're studying, generous in the sense of allowing it to expand in its own I hate to use this word, but it, in its own ontological regime, in a sense. Um, finally, the question about right to knowledge. Uh, I think the first answer to that would be, how about asking yourself what that idea of right to knowledge comes from? And uh, not considering it as a given, as a given something that should be accepted as such, but to, to address the people who claim this right to knowledge and, and force them to ask themselves, where does this right come from? What sort of right is it? Uh, why do you think you have it? And so on and so forth. Um, that would be my answer to that question. And I'll leave it, I'll leave it to that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I think um, I, I can speak to the first question and the third question at the same time because I think they kind of overlapped in the sense that um, the first question was asking with these new terrains, with right wing groups, because um, they were both kind of political questions, right? With these right wing groups, do we need different methods? Um, or new terminology? Should we not speak about impossibility or translation with them? Um, and, and the third question was about, um, uh, you know, how can we, I mean, and I think I think it was really going, you know, you guys kind of work in, 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 in very far away places maybe, and, um, and talking about impossibility is very unattractive, let's say, just speaking from my, like, from my, my presentation's terminology that might be unattractive, might be unattractive for applied anthropologists, let's say, like, how could that become acceptable for us to work that into our um, to to apply it anthropo anthropological practice. Um, and I think, so I think they overlap in the sense that um, I think uh, a approaching right-wing groups is precisely where we need to, to kind of at least leave space um, as ethnographers for the impossible, for the impossible being that we can never really relate actually nor would we want to potentially, right? If we espouse openness to cultural difference, you know, how could we possibly uh, espouse or feel sympathetic to hatred 
of otherness. I mean, I, I think that's impossible, right? Um, so it's built in, in that particular case, it's built in and kind of necessary to that ethnographic practice, right? To say, it will be impossible for me to fully, you know, be one with these people. But at the same time, I'm seeking to understand them. And I imagine people working on right-wing groups are precisely trying to understand them to, to, to transcend um, a, a kind of the, the kind of the impossibility of communication to a certain extent. We might not be able to at all, but there is a need to kind of bridge the impossibility in order, or to at least attempt, as I was saying, as citing Kafka, to attempt to bridge the, the impossibility in order to kind of get somewhere else. Whether that will be anywhere anywhere productive, we also don't know. It is impossible to know the productivity of that. So that, on the one hand, um, and on the other hand, um, you know, I, I think this can be communicated to to um, applied anthropologists precisely because it can be part of any um, you know anthropological endeavor, any kind of applied project. Um, there will be failures. There will be people who who fall by the wayside, um, and and this is it is necessary for us to to reflect on failure um, and on the impossibility of kind of applying anthropology well or somehow somehow um, as 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 something to kind of really. Um, you know, which which won't necessarily invalidate, right? The the whole of the enterprise just because we can't it can't be perfect doesn't invalidate what what we're actually trying to do. So again, I do I do act even though it kind of sounds you know I don't know whatever highfalutin or something, but but I I think you know really taking the impossible you know allows us you know more space. Um, more opening for whatever shifts we need to take in a given moment to try to make things work a little better. Um, but back to the kind of right right wing situation, I mean, if we take a really farther step back, I mean, this is unfortunately, and maybe this is the tragedy, but it's also a fact of our lives, right? It's, it's a fact of our world that there are all of these positions which are incommensurable. Um, and, and I mean, we just need to learn how to work with it, you know, in order to, in order to, to live with it. I mean, we're in, we've, we're at multiple, right now in the middle of this pandemic, we're in multiple impasses, right? Um, we have to be here. We have no choice. Um, you know, we can hope that the 2016 American elections will, 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 you know, be okay. And we will stop being subjected to, you know the the crazy propaganda coming out of the United States. You know whatever, but but this is our world right now. Um, so we need to learn to live and dwell with impossibility and and use it as a moment to think about and to engage with the possibility of transformation, even if we'll never entirely do away with that. Um, and on on the question of and I, and I think this even goes to the question of of you know how to be a good ethnographer. Not to say that I'm a good ethnographer, but but um, you know, we need to be able to kind of at least see what other people's impasses and impossibilities actually are. I think their limits, um, I think, is also kind of an interesting place to go. Not to be, I mean, to go to to the question about uncertainty. Not to necessarily write with uncertain with certainty. We shouldn't write necessarily with certainty, but we should also potentially look at others ways of dealing with uncertainty and the way they engage with the, the, the various impossibilities and paths that they face. So, I mean, I think in a way, my answer goes to all the questions at once. Oh, just one more thing about the right to, the right to knowledge. Uh, and I think this once again, kind of comes back to impossibility, but in a different kind of way. Um, in uh, particularly in North American indigenous ethnography, there's, um, there have been recent discussions of ethnographic refusal as well, um, which is uh, indigenous North American groups refusing ethnographic engagement, right? And 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 this this is an impossibility that we need to work with. And indeed, Audra Simpson has this excellent book, um, Mohawk Interruptus, where she, as an as 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 Mohawk, but as an anthropologist, has to write with this refusal in mind. So whether or not it, it upsets some scholars or researchers 
to have no longer have rights to that knowledge, um, they are going to have to deal with ethnographic refusal, which bears, of course, on Anne Christine's discussion of the desire for ethnography. There are some moments where people, where the interlocutors have no desire for ethnography. And what kind of ethnography are you going to write then? Mm. Thank you very much. That's really very insightful. I can't resist making a further comment to these, um, which has to do with, um, you know, I like very much Anne Christine's take on worry, because she puts this business of of the ethnographic encounter as sitting on a on a kind of worry. She puts it on both sides. Um, and she's showing us that there is a worry from the point of view of the ethnographer, and there is a worry from the point of view of the ethnographized, um, uh, the respondent, and, and these encounter. And the thing that I feel that often has not been um, answered is that there are contexts of uh, impossibility of ethnography, where the anxiety, uh, that ethnography always produces in the ethnographer is life-threatening or mentally, psychologically threatening, and it has to be stopped. And I think that this is something that we often, anthropologists, we see ethnographies as zeros. Uh, we don't see the fact that we as ethnographers have to protect ourselves from situations which can be excessively anxious. And so I think there is a sense in which we have to, uh, th there is a, a great depth in what Anne Christine is telling us about uh, the, the desire for ethnography and the way ethnography is always an engagement to go back to, to Marilyn Strathern. And there are contexts in which that's not possible. And I think knowing that is a trick for being a good ethnographer. Okay, well, um, let us consider uh, if there are any further uh, uh, questions or raised hands and we will look at them now because we still have five minutes uh, uh, where that could happen. Right, so here we have Barbara Loredo from Sao Paulo. Yeah, hi there, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to hear some comment, just some comment about the confrontation with the difference from the observation of the inevitable condition of a specific type of interaction to reproduce, to biologically reproduce, that there is the material phenomenon of being a sexed species, regardless of the European, uh, European or American generification of it, <laughs> uh, regardless of the generification. I mean, uh, wouldn't that be uh, some starting point for the cross-societies issues? Uh, Levi Strauss uh, centralized, centralized the issues of um, kinship uh, and family organizations, uh, but for example, but I, I, I was just wondering the perception of a continuity of oneself in the world through reproduction uh, or questions like uh, rape for the purpose of raising, as it happens here in Brazil with indigenous women, uh, it appears centrally in the production of the difference of the uh, the otherness question. I see this in some analysis like Verena Stolkos, uh, but in general, I I do not find the centrality of this question, the reproduction question, uh, in some debates of on otherness. Uh, I. I hope it makes some sense, but <laughs> just want to know uh, why um, of uh, why this this question is not centered in this debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Rowan. I understand there is somebody that has left us some questions. Maybe we can um, we can hear them. We can read them. So. Eric Petschelis, again from Sao Paulo, says, could Anne Christine speak about the idea that ethnography is an exercise in translating indigenous modes of translation? And I'm thinking about 
Oh, I didn't read the request. Uh, Viveris de Castro's statement that anthropology means comparing anthropologies. Thank you very much. Should we have the next one, please? So, Hannah Waddle um, from Poland is asking us, to what degree would you agree that it is the task of the ethnographer to create meaning by making doubt processes and dynamics? Uh, again, I couldn't read it to the end. The specific and visible. Thank you. Thank you. And then there is Fazil Moradi from my old an, uh, alma mater in Johannesburg. Isn't it remarkable to learn how the so-called classical colonial ethnographical imaginary, but that is exemplified in all the three presentations. Are we back in the great witchcraft rationality? I imagine him, he wants to finish by saying debate or the political that also annihilates millions of women in Europe. Oh, and how does this unforgiving binary imaginary connect with Derrida? Don't, take on. Okay, all right. Well, let's see whether our speakers now can answer these questions, unless there is still some, another one. Uh, Michel Federnadov, um, thank you all. Can the presenters please discuss the relationship between transduction and translation? Might the correspondence allow for a, uh, of them translatable. I think this is a question for Stefan, right? <laughs> It'll be, yeah, I'm sure he'll like to answer that. Okay, uh, uh, Rowan, I think we stop here and we will um, have answers from our speakers and then we'll probably get to an end. Okay, um, well, let me, let me just, since we are practically out of time, uh, uh, you know, I, I've used uh, the transduction metaphor, I suppose, uh, you know, one should call it, uh, you know, translation is also a metaphor in, in, in a sense, uh, in order, I mean, you know, transduction, uh, if you think about uh, the origins of the term, uh, is the transformation of some form of energy into another one. And of course, with the attendant uh, tendency towards uh, entropy. And so um, I think uh, transduction is probably uh, as good a metaphor, especially if we're dealing with non-linguistic phenomena as, as there might be. But, uh, but it just happens that, you know, sort of, uh, you know, ever since the 1970s, we've explicitly been talking about uh, cultural translation. And, uh, and the field of translation studies is fascinating as it is in, in, in linguistics. Uh, there's, you know, my colleague Sue Gal has just uh, a couple of years ago uh, written a review article in the annual reviews about the politics of translation. And uh, and my, unfortunately, late colleague Michael Silverstein uh, has also written quite extensively about, uh, you know, the transduction metaphor as well. So, you know, I, I wouldn't want to pre you know, preempt too much time now at the others address a slew of, you know, super interesting questions, which you know, come at the very end of a long session. <laughs> I'd be happy to continue the conversation in some form or the other via email. Or... Thank you. Um, maybe I'm Christine would like to say something. Just very briefly um, uh, on transduction. Yes, <clears throat> I agree. I think transduction is a good metaphor for better than translation, in a sense, uh, for for what ethnography is about. Uh, and I also rather liked <clears throat> the, uh, I can't remember the exact, the, the, the question, I rather liked the, uh, uh, the question uh, whether ethnography is precisely about uh, uh, making doubt and uncertainty uh, visible, yes, uh, by making doubt processes and dynamics specific and visible. Um, yes, I think that's a, also a good definition of, of, of ethnography. I agree with that. Um, the question of reproduction, uh, we didn't focus on it uh, directly for all sorts of reasons, uh, but needless to say, it is something that is 
fundamental uh, in is a, a, a fundamental question for all Amazonian groups. And I touched on it very briefly when I mentioned their interest, when I quoted uh, from a famous article by Damata Seeger, Viveros de Castro and so forth, uh, in which it is stated that their sociology is a physiology. In a sense, that is precisely uh, what it is about. So uh, indirectly, in a sense, uh, we I did I did take aboard that question, uh, though obviously not in any any kind of detail. Um, that's really all I have to say to uh, to these quest to the questions as I, as I saw them. But, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm actually going to do the question of the unforgiving binary, which is it's it's an interesting and provocative question here. Um, and, and, and the way I'll answer it is by referring to a similar critique made that Marshall Sollins made to Marilyn Strathairn um, in his book on kinship. One of the things, and one of the things that Marilyn Strathairn has been criticized for, um, at, and various others as well, from Sabah Mahmoud to Talal Asad to whoever, um, is about, is precisely about this binary and about, about radical difference. But I'll, I'll just use, um, uh, Marilyn Strathairn is an example. One of the things that Marshall Salins said um, in his book was that, you know, oh, she created this radically other individual and now everybody's taking the individual and the individual is everywhere. And everybody's a individual now. And so this is like, this is the kind of way non, non-modern personhood is. He, he was griping, he was complaining, whatever. But I think it's grounded on a fundamental misunderstanding um, of what Marilyn Scherzen was doing or what other people can do with exploring this difference. So one of the things that Marilyn, Marilyn was doing um, in The Gender of the Gift throughout her work um, by shifting and displacing all of our common concepts, including individual and society, is not only to pretend to apprehend or to apprehend the other in their radical difference. Because one of the things that, that, that Strathern kind of set, uh, argues is that we can't really get out of our own frames, right? We can't become unhinged, uh, to put it in Stefan's terms. We can't really become unhinged. We can only approximate it. We can, we can you know, it can become part of our description, et cetera. So what, what the binary is trying to do, in fact, um, is trying to show that we ourselves can become other. So if we think that there is an individual and we think that the individual is everywhere, but if we go a little bit further, we realize that the individual is, is at the base of some of our most radical pro political problems. If we displace the individual and, and see the individual and see that not necessarily is only the radical otherness, but the possibility for ourselves, for everyone, for whatever, as one of the human possibilities, I don't think um, the, the, the accusation, if you will, of establishing a radical binary opposition actually holds. It is to, explore, it is to explore, explore the poles in order to see where we can transform to. So um, if, if, if one chooses to still see that as a kind of colonial practice, that's, you know, that's one's choice. It may be impossible to convince people with those positions, but one of the things that anthropology can do is to see how we can all be other than we are. So that's, I don't hear anybody anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Well, I think we have reached the end of our time and the end of our capacity to think sanely. Uh, and I must, Thank very much, um, Stefan and Christine and Ashley, for having provided us with a really extraordinary, intellectually rich moment. Um, and I was quite glad to see that we actually did manage to have some debate and some uh, engagement. And that really gives me a great pleasure. Thank you very much for everybody that was attending. And thank you very much in particular to the people that were sitting in the podium with me. Bye-bye.